So I suppose it's about time to talk about Christmas stockings. Um, in some parts of Europe, it could also be Christmas shoes, uh, although I've never heard of this, but according to the internet, this is a thing. But uh, I suppose if you, you don't have very big socks, but you've got some big shoes, it might be useful. It, I think um, back in the day, you didn't really have a, a dedicated stocking, did you? You just used like, your football socks. I remember hearing about my parents saying that they just used their football socks as their stockings rather than an actual dedicated Christmas stocking like I had. Yeah. With my name on, written in permanent marker <laughs> at the top. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had sort of a dedicated kiddies Christmas stocking. Yeah. But there's that, there's that tradition, isn't it? We, we never did it in my household or anything. I'm not, not sure many people did, but it's an older thing where you would nail the stocking to the, to the, the mantelpiece. To the mantelpiece. Yeah. Right, yeah, again, it seems like mm -hmm. a bit of a fire hazard if you've got an open mm. fireplace that you actually use for a fire. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, I, for me, the stocking was you'd get loads of um, stocking filler style toys mm. small toys really whereas i think for my parents generation or older you would get like things like an orange i'm gonna talk or about like a that, few yeah. walnuts or something I okay so i still ahead. get those oh really <laughs> well not anymore i'm a grown man but <laughs> I, I got them when i was getting stockings right. okay. as a, a child but yes um the one of the stories of the origin of the stocking is that one of the bags that saint nicholas threw um, into the three girls' houses, landed into a socking drying over the fireplace. And so it's seen as like good luck to use a stocking right. next to the fireplace. We always used to put them um, just in front of the fireplace rather than uh -huh. like attaching them to the top. That's probably because my parents didn't want us messing up the fireplace yeah. more so than anything. Well, I grew up in a tiny little working class house. We didn't have a fireplace. They were left at the end of our bed. <laughs> That's also pretty Just normal. That. I've heard that plenty of times, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Although it must be more difficult to to sneak in without being awoken. I'm surprised how they did it, to be quite mm. honest. Or like, did you put, for the tooth fairy, put your milk teeth under your pillow and mm. then you got a, a 50p or a pound coin or something? How they did that without waking me up? Quite impressive, really. I think when you're a little kid, <clears throat> you do sleep like quite soundly mm -hmm. once you're in a deep sleep. I do remember once pretending to be asleep and trying to catch the tooth fairy. And then I was just like, oh, oh, wait, it's got, gone the same way as Santa Claus. I see how it is. <laughs> well, it's like, do you remember, I obviously don't remember because that's the point of this, but when you were a kid and you'd fall asleep, perhaps sometimes, and you were taken upstairs to bed and put in bed and you didn't wake up the whole time. Mm. You know, like when you're five or something, you fell asleep in front of the TV That's weird because you wake up evening. and you, you have no idea yeah. where you are for a little while. So I was physically picked up, mm. carried upstairs, put in bed, tucked in, and none of that woke me up. I do get to Whereas... relive that sometimes when I've had a bit too much to drink. <laughs> oh, right, yes, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been carried to bed. <laughs> That's never been quite that bad. Go on autopilot when you remember being pretty drunk at the pub and mm. don't remember going home at all, but oh, you yeah, do my, wake up in bed. My somehow. ability to drunk teleport is fantastic. <laughs> right. I'm just like, how on, sometimes I'll turn up at my front door just like, how on earth did I get here? It's like, I'm not even, I'm not even that drunk. It's remarkable sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, I'm going to go on a tangent in a minute talking about how, how good your memory is when you're not trying to focus on it. It's almost like consciously focusing on it makes it worse, but oh, right. never... Never mind. We touched on that once in a we contemplation. Did, yeah. so. so I'm going to talk about the orange and nuts in the stocking okay, now because right. this is an aspect of Christmas that was most enigmatic to me. I could kind of see how other things had come about as traditions, but the, the orange and nuts thing was just like, well, why on earth is this a thing? So um, obviously in the past, oranges were not so common to come across, particularly in Northern <laughs> Europe. So... They were just seen as a rare treat. You had to order them to get them delivered. Quite often they would be sold by roving merchants. So they were actually quite a rare treat. And obviously they're sweet. They are nice. I mean, I like oranges. And in the middle of winter as well. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself is quite obvious. Um, I've, I saw something which, was, which really annoyed me, actually, um, more, more so than it should have. It was a bunch of American news outlets saying, well, people put oranges and nuts in stockings in the Great Depression because times were hard and they couldn't get proper presents. 
but then my grandparents, who predate the Great Depression, had it in their stockings. So that's obviously not true, because they're not going to be copying America in, you know, 1920s England for a start, and especially not a tradition that would have been that recent. So with my own anecdotal knowledge, I can debunk that one. <laughs> But yeah, it, was, it, it surprised me that people were claiming it was that young a tradition. And it, it sounds like nonsense to me. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Trying to, trying to claim our traditions again, Americans, damn you. So yes, um, also, um, where was I? Um, oh yes. So an orange also could represent the, the sack of gold which St. Nicholas gave the children as well, in that it's somewhat golden-y, I suppose. It's orange. It's shiny-ish. I mean, in a very loose sense, it symbolises stuff. And of course, oranges are used in Christian um, traditions. I forgot what it's called when you stick the, the candle in it. Um, but that's got Christian connotations. So I think that it just seems like something that's symbolic and obviously nuts. Um, are something that you can keep and in the past were quite prized, weren't they? Right. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have a good selection of nuts. And I think Brazil nuts at Christmas are particularly associated with one another. And obviously you don't get Brazil nuts growing in, say, Europe. Funnily enough, I think they come from Brazil. Um, <laughs> it might be one of those names where it's a bit misleading, but it, it's one of those things where it's, it's just something that's not that common, but on, on a small paycheck, it's something that you can afford to give your kids that is still a treat, but by modern standards is not. Yeah, there's a, you know, when you're in the street with people who have roasted nuts, usually, what is it, like uh, hazelnuts or, mm. or something? Um, that's sort of fairly Christmassy, isn't it? I think uh, walnuts quite often... Mm. Um, they're a Christmassy thing. And like I said, Saturnalia, they would bet with them. But again, because they keep all year round, that's sort of part of the thing, is that you're guaranteed that they're not going to go off. Like you say, an orange or a Satsuma or something in the middle of winter, in the in the world where you don't just fly any, any fruit you want around the world any time of year, you know, that's a very modern thing. Mm. So uh, the idea that you'd have a fresh orange... Or something like that in, in yeah. the middle of winter is yeah, it's actually a bit of a treat to be quite honest. And it's probably quite good for you at that time as well. It's yeah, vitamin C, cold season. I know that we're playing around with time here, but I know that even we had rationing in England long after World War Two mm -hmm. ended. My dad told me about how he was born when we were still rationing sweets and sugar and right, things like yeah. that. And the was idea that you fifty nine right yeah, and the idea that you'd have a banana would be a real treat. But wow, like some kids in the 50s, like having a banana for the first time. Sounds crazy, right? Because mm. <laughs> we're, we're used to such opulence, really. You go into a Waitrose or something or a Sainsbury's and there's just a, a wall of fruit from all around the world, year round. In the middle of January, you can get fresh strawberries <laughs> bought over from Argentina or whatever, wherever. It's really quite... Um, Decadent, to be quite honest. Yeah. It, compared to even a few decades ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, my, uh, my parents and their generation, the idea of having a bit of chocolate was like a real, a real treat. You would, if you got a, a chocolate bar, it would be shared out between the siblings and you might get one square and you would let it melt in your mouth. You'd make it last for as long as possible. Whereas now we'll just get like a Mars bar duo and just chomp it down and eat it and it's gone, <laughs> right? It's so, <laughs> right? It's so very different. With the idea that just an orange is a real treat. Mm. I mean, it's sweet really in a way, isn't it? It uh, is, yeah. The, the much more simpler world, even a few decades ago, even one lifetime mm. ago. I feel a bit bad kind of scorning the orange now because when I was a kid, I'd <laughs> yeah, be like, what right. is this? Yeah, I'm not interested in this. This doesn't... This doesn't play any games, does it? I remember doing exactly that, having my kid's stocking. It's filled with little trinkets, little toys to play with, but also once or twice an orange in there. And me and my siblings being like, what's this? Get rid of it. Don't be stupid. <laughs> and and trying to be told something about it. Mm. That used to be a thing. We don't care. <laughs> we don't care. No, where's, mm. the next, where's the next toy? 
It's really ungrateful, really. But, um... <laughs> yeah, looking back, I do feel a bit guilty <laughs> well, that they're trying to pass on this age-old tradition of, of something that's quite wholesome and nice, and then as kids, you're just brutally honest about it, just like, yeah, I'm not interested. Yeah. I suppose there was also a period of time in which I knew um, Santa Claus wasn't real, but I didn't want my parents to know that I knew, so I'd just be like, well, I don't know what Santa's doing with this. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell Santa to get real? <laughs> yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so actually, I think I saw um, Slavoj Zizek once talk about how that's a really interesting bit in a child's development, in a, in a child's life, when mm. the child knows Santa isn't real, the parents know the kid knows, and yet everyone continues the pretense. <laughs> right, it's interesting, isn't it? It's like some sort yeah. of... Um, 1980, late 80s Soviet Union thing where the leaders know it, it's not working, the people know it doesn't work, but they carry on anyway because they don't know any other means of, what's, what was it um, Adam Curtis called it? Hyper-normalisation. There right. we go. It's funny, it plays out in all sorts of ways. I think it was Zizek again said, the idea of at the end of a date, come up for some coffee. Everyone knows it's not coffee, <laughs> but you still <laughs> pretend, oh yeah, we just, you know. Um, and you we play along with stories and narratives mm. that no one is fooled by. No one, everyone knows what is really going on. And uh, I just think that that time when, because in my house, I was probably the same with yours, that it was never explicitly talked about. By the time you're 15, mm. everyone knows. And that you still, not even without really a wink, you still talk about Santa. Mm. Like this is a present from mum, this is a present from dad, and this is a present from Santa with From Santa written in your mum's <laughs> handwriting. And yet you don't mm. say, stop doing that, that's stupid. You still, everyone, you know, you, you like it, you play along with it. As, mm. um, I don't know, I think that's you an interesting cycle. You don't a good thing, do you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And talking of a good thing, uh, Christmas dinners. Although, to be fair, to be a nitpicker here, I have it at lunchtime, so I don't know why it's called a, a dinner. Does, do you know of anyone who has it on the evening rather than for lunch? No. But it's just like Sunday dinner, isn't it? Sunday roast. Yeah, exactly. You have at lunchtime, really. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose you don't really need another meal afterwards. Normally we have right. like um, a cheese board or something for dinner. Like dinner dinner, not for Christmas dinner. Or like a cold trimmings at dinner mm. time um, or something like that normally from you have the, the Christmas dinner. Normally you have the leftover turkey and a, right. a Boxing Day curry or something. That's a, right. a tradition of of ours that we've kind of invented, mainly because turkey is pretty difficult to make, to taste nice, so you've got to suffocate the, the flavour of it, or the know, lack thereof. I don't know what it was like in your household, but um, Christmas lunch, Christmas dinner, was actually usually a bit later, more like two or three in the afternoon, because you're waiting for the, for the, for the potatoes, to, <laughs> or, or you know, you're waiting for the turkey to finish mm. roasting, or... Something. Normally it'd be about one o'clock. Right. Normally it'd be set for one o'clock sharp. Yeah. But <laughs> one, one thing that um, is a bit unusual with my household that's a, a tradition is that, um, that the kids would open the presents from Santa Claus in the morning and just before Christmas um, lunch or Christmas dinner, I suppose, you'd have the presents from the parents, but then the presents from everyone else would be opened after Christmas dinner. Ooh. And it kind of spreads out the day a bit more. Mm. But very few households I've spoke to actually do that. Normally it's just a free-for-all in the morning where everyone opens everything. And then by the time Christmas dinner's over with, everything's done. You're just kind of lounging around. Yeah. Whereas this kind of spreads it out until about five, six o'clock sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Have Christmas dinner, watch the Queen's speech, or as King's speech as it will now be. Watch the Queen's speech. Maybe there's an Only Fools and Horses special or something. Yeah, no, in my household, you had uh, stockings as soon as you woke up, which were probably very, very early. Um, then breakfast, and after breakfast was a complete free-for-all where everything's opened in a, in a chaotic maelstrom of about half an <laughs> hour, maybe 45 minutes, where everything's opened. Just complete madness. Mm -hmm. I remember it being torture, having to wait, just, just saying, is... Is the Christmas dinner ready yet? Is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? Just because I wanted to open my presents and I wouldn't eat my, my food because I wanted to open the presents. Mm. I didn't want to eat. Mm. Whereas now it's the other way around. I'm just like, yeah, I want the food. 
hurry up. Well, in one in um, close uh, friends of the family, we know uh, they had a tradition where you, nothing got opened until after Christmas dinner. And we always that. we always thought in our household that that was just torture. That was just mm. like a needless way to torture the kids. Uh, well, <laughs> anyway, it worked for their household. That, That's what yeah. they did. But we had, yeah, after, uh, of course, we couldn't wait for the grown-ups to finish their breakfast. Like, why are we waiting you, for you to finish breakfast? Why can't we just open them now? But mm. there were some rules, and it was after breakfast. I always would get set a time when I was allowed to wake up. So I'd always be awake <laughs> really? before that. Okay. So they're just like, yes, at this time, you're allowed to come and get us right. uh, and wake us up. So I'd be their alarm clock, pretty much. <laughs> but no, uh, those days are gone. Now my, my Christmas consists of a bit of a lion, which is a gift enough on its own these days. Because I'm not a big drinker, really, mm. at all, but I'm not teetotal. But if I do ever get drunk or have a, a drink, a fair amount to drink, it's usually Christmas Eve. The it's more of, of a day for Eve. drinking than, right. than Christmas Day for me. Uh, well, ever since I've been an adult, anyway, quite often go out on Christmas Eve. Or, or if I do stay in, drink. I've never really Christmas gone Eve. out for a drink, but it would be sitting with the family, having a drink. But what that means is Christmas morning, as an adult, mm. is a little bit hungover <laughs> or, or, or have a lie-in, have a bit of a lie-in. Mm. So again, the absolute opposite from when you're a small kid. And, um, but yeah, again, as an adult, Christmas dinner is kind of the highlight of the day. Because it's nearly always just a really, really massive, delicious roast dinner, right? Yeah, you're making me quite hungry now, actually. With stuffing and gravy and <laughs> mm -hmm. all the trimmings. And in fact, I've blankets. got a full list of the traditional ingredients here. So, okay, okay. at least in Britain, um, a roasted turkey, stuffing, Yorkshire puddings, pigs in blankets, roast potatoes, Brussels sprouts, parsnips, carrots, um, with gravy, cranberry sauce and bread sauce. Anything missing there? Anything jumping out of you oh. at you for being a bit strange? Well, we never had bread sauce. Mm -hmm. I don't really like bread sauce. It's a bit weird. We'd always have cranberry sauce and no one touch it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm very particular about my gravy. It needs to be very thick, very viscous, as thick as possible, I, I agree. really. Put a spoon mm -hmm. in it and the spoon doesn't fall over. That's how thick I like my gravy. <laughs> Drench it in gravy. Mm -hmm. I love stuffing. You've got to have uh, Yorkshire pudding. I don't know if that's a thing Americans have much, Yorkshire pudding. I, I, I think that's mainly a British thing, okay. Yorkshire pudding. But that's absolutely part of it. I, I love Yorkshire puddings, Yorkshire yeah. Puddings You've got to put the gravy in the Yorkshire pudding oh, yeah, and yeah, have yeah, it like yeah. a little little pool. Brussels sprouts is a must. Again, mm. when I was a child, I hated Brussels sprouts. Like, they'd actually make me gag, <laughs> right? And now, I love Brussels sprouts. I don't mind a sprout. I'll, I'll eat them. Oh, I'll happily. I've... I only eat them around Christmas anyway. I don't, I don't think to myself... Outside of Christmas time, you know what? I'm going to have some Brussels sprouts. Like would it doesn't not, appeal to me. Would you not have them with just a Sunday roast? Um, I don't think so. I mm. don't really have a tradition of it. Like a Sunday roast, like a normal one, a non-Christmas one, it'd be um, broccoli, carrots, potatoes, maybe parsnips. Yeah, parsnips. Yeah, just Swede. An assortment. That, yeah, Swede sometimes. Although that's more of a stew thing, I think. <laughs> I don't know. It sometimes you would get it though. But yes, historically, of course, the bird used to be a goose, but now it's a turkey. Um, but I'm going to talk about some other ones, non-British ones, particularly some interesting ones. So I know you know this one um, because it came up in a pub quiz we did. But um, after a successful advertising campaign in the 1970s, KFC is regarded as a customary Christmas meal in Japan that has to be reserved months in advance, apparently, due to its popularity. And the idea of being on a, a list to get KFC <laughs> is a bit strange to me, but there we go. Also, um, Go and Catholics tend to have a pork vindaloo or beef stew um, on Christmas oh. Day. Um, in Goa in India, is that? Mm. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, Czechs and Austrians traditionally have fried carp. Um, the Portuguese tend to have cod. I've never actually tried carp. I've caught loads of carp fishing, like yeah. just lake fishing, and I've... Well, it's normally been a proper fishing place, so you can't take the fish, but the notion of eating a carp seems very strange to me. Yeah, I know I the Polish... I've never eaten carp, no, you're right, yeah. I didn't really know it was edible. <laughs> right, yeah. But um, in Sweden, the most popular Christmas dessert is rice pudding, which is served with an almond hidden inside, and whoever finds the almond is um, expected to get married before next Christmas. 
similar to like the bouquet of flowers at a wedding, isn't it? That you throw out, you know, that catches it as the next to be married. I was going to say a bit of pressure. Yeah. <laughs> I've always thought that what if you're already married? Yeah, right. What if you're sat next to your spouse and you get, yeah. you get it? It's like, oh, well, sorry, it looks like we're getting divorced. <laughs> One of the things I knew that it used to be in the medieval period, um, quite often it would be pork mm -hmm. um, and the hog's head was a thing. Um, I sometimes you even see it in sort of mm. old Victorian things. You'd have a hog's head with an apple stuffed in its mouth. Um, that was very, very traditionally Christmas, a Christmas dinner thing. Um, and we don't really do that anymore, do we? It seems a bit... No. A I, bit... Wouldn't, I wouldn't mind eating pork at Christmas, though. I mean, I prefer it to turkey. At least you get some crackling out of pork. Right, like yeah. Nice, crispy... It's like pork scratchings, basically, isn't it? But warm. It's even better. Or an actual hog roast, where you have a whole suckling pig on a, on a spit mm. that you roast over... An open yeah. fire. If, if only I grew up in a house where that were possible. Right, right. yeah. I think that's more for sort of a, a Lord's Hall, mm -hmm. where you'd have a big hall. Um, uh, yeah, but anyway, the hog's head was sort of an integral part of it. And I think that even to this day, some of the more ancient colleges of Oxford or Cambridge, um, they'll still have uh, a roast hog and bring out the head on a platter and things. Well, seems a bit macabre to us, it, sort of normal people. But... It'd be a bit weird to look into the eyes of the animal you're eating. That's, mm. that's one thing. <laughs> right, yeah. I, I suppose it's just normal, really, isn't it? <laughs> it's just me being used to Western decadence. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.